Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Everybody. My name is Angie P. and I'm an alcoholic. And let me tell you something. If you are happy about your sobriety, let me hear you make some noise up in here. That's what I'm talking about. Like Dane said, if you're not finished with your nap, you finish with it now. <laughs> Man, I'm so grateful to be here. What an honor it is to be able to be up here. And you'll hear from my story how, man, this is amazing. This is amazing for somebody like me to be able to be in Akron at Founders Day carrying the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'll be forever grateful for all of you guys. I want to thank the committee for having me here, and I really want to thank the people from Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky who came here to support me, man. I love you, man. I'm so glad you guys are here. I got to thank my friend Jack C. If you guys, I'm sure some of y'all have heard him. This man is just off the chain, and I love him to death. My friends from Chicago, well, I'm so glad to see y'all. I don't know what to do. Man, this is it right here. I don't know about y'all, but it don't get no better than this right here. If I die tomorrow, I'm cool with that. I'm cool with it. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm going to qualify here. I'm from Greenville, South Carolina. And back home, we lived in a little, a little white house on a red clay road. We got our water out of wells. We took baths in steel tubs. We drank buttermilk and ate cornbread on a regular basis. And that was the life. Life was simple. We picked blackberries for fun. I didn't even wear shoes until I got to Cincinnati. That's how country we were. And, uh, you know, I had flaming red hair and freckles, and nobody else in my family did. Imagine that. And uh, my brother one day out at the outhouse told me, he said, uh, you know, the reason why you look the way you do is because the, uh, the mailman is your daddy. And uh, so uh, whenever I would see the mailman coming down the road, I'd be like, Daddy! I go, my daddy right there. And he would put his arms around me and tell me how cute I was. And thank God for the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous and sponsorship. That turned out to be a little pattern for me, actually. You know, you put your arms around me and tell me how cute I was. We were, we were basically married at that point. And, uh, you know, and, and six months down the road, I'm going, what's your last name again? You know what I mean? And, and some of you ladies, you might, well, some of you men, too, while I'm uh, tripping. But, uh. So I'm from a family of Baptist ministers, and uh, my, uh, my father got transferred to Cincinnati, and so he uh, was traveling back and forth and uh, found himself a little girlfriend, and he raised, uh, had, he brought us to Cincinnati, and uh, that left my mother to raise my brother and sister and myself. And I must tell you that when I first got to Alcoholics Anonymous, my mother was my biggest issue. If she would have just treated me the way she treated my brother and sister, I would not be in this predicament. At a meeting of AA, talking about I'm an alcoholic. See, it was my mother's fault. But I must tell you that my mother struggles with mental illness. And because of the way that we were raised religiously, she doesn't believe in taking medication. And I'm going to tell you something. It's one of the hardest things that I've had to watch. And one of the hardest things that I've had to deal with because I always believed that my mother would be of sane and sound mind for the rest of her life. But let me tell you something, Alcoholics Anonymous. You guys were the ones that taught me how to love my mother, how to quit expecting things for her and understand that she came into this world with her own set of problems that don't have anything to do with me. It's easy for me to go to Alcoholics Anonymous and sit in a meeting and shake hands and empty ashtrays. But can I go home and be with my mother and listen to her abuse? Can I do that? Can I work the program of Alcoholics Anonymous in my home? You guys taught me that. 
But I called my mother before I was coming to talk, and I said, Mama, I'm up here in Akron now. And uh, she said, Oh, Lord. <laughs> she said, I guess they want to hear you this time, too, don't they? I said, You know, Mama, they seem to like what I got to say. Well, I've been in your life for almost 50 years, and I too much don't care what you have to say. So I'm really thankful for you, Alcoholics Anonymous, that, uh, that you guys are relatively happy when you see me. I thank you for that. So my mother decided, because my mother cleaned bathrooms for a living, so she decided that she wanted uh, us to have the best of education. It was real important in my family that we not say the word ain't. We had to speak perfect English. She sent us to Catholic schools. So now I had a flaming red afro, freckles on my face, a white blouse, a plaid skirt, bobby socks, and black and white spaldings. And, and it didn't, didn't look normal, you know what I mean? It, it didn't look normal, and I accepted that when I looked in the mirror, I looked different than everybody else I saw. But I'm at this Catholic school, and I'm doing the best I can. So this girl named Squeaky, Squeaky was like 6'10 in the fifth grade, right? So she, she had brought her little posse to, you know, got them together after school, and they stoned me on the way home from school, right? So I ran in the house, and I told my mother, I said, Whew, I'm glad I made it in the house. Squeaky then was about to kill me. And I knew whenever my mother sounded like this that we was going to have problems. She said, you know, Angela, at some point you're going to have to learn how to take care of yourself. So I want you to go out there and you stand up to Squeaky. I said, you want me to do what? She said, you go out there and you stand up to Squeaky or you stay in here and get this butt whooping that I can give you. And I already knew what hers felt like and I only knew what Squeaky's appeared to be. So... So I went out, we lived in the project, so I went out to the parking lot where we had most of our duels. And I walked up to her and I said, my mother said I'm supposed to fight you. And she said, well, come on then. So, so I balled up my fist and I closed my eyes as tight as I could. <laughs> and I knew I had to reach up, right? So I squinted my eyes and I said, Psh. oh, I got it right here, y'all. It was the happiest day of my life. It was the happiest day of my life. But I need to tell you, the squeaky didn't budge when I hit her. So I looked at her and I said, you getting ready to kill me, ain't you? And, uh, and, and she did. She gave me the big beat down. But I got this thing called alcoholism that helps me remember what I should forget and forget what I should remember. And what I forgot, what I forgot was that she almost killed me. What I remembered was that I hit her. And from that point on, I became a boxer. Oh, listen, I fought every opportunity I got. When I got sober in Cincinnati up at 405 Oak Street, I tell everybody, I got, I got a, sw a sponsor, right? White woman. I told her, hey, hey, her sister, you need to check my track record. I've hurt people. I have hurt some people. And, you know, you get those sponsors that just kind of answer you and go, ooh, I'm scared. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> You know those sponsors that just, you ain't, they don't care. You know what I mean? And, uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm going to this Catholic school, and one day my mother comes to get me. She was working as a waitress when she sent us to, uh, to Catholic schools where she got a better job for the company called Avon. And she came and got me one day on my 12th birthday, and she took me to this neighborhood, and she said, Angie, we don't have to live in the projects anymore. This is our new house. And we were the first African-American family to move over in this all-white neighborhood. So from the age of 13 to probably 20, I wasn't even black no more. <laughs> I listened to Bob Seger and the Silver Bullet Band. <laughs> I know it's funny. I know it's funny. My favorite girl group was Heart. First uh, concert I ever went to was Led Zeppelin, 1979, baby. Right, but I have to tell you this. I was at the Ted Nugent Foreigner concert one night, right? Foreigner was singing Feels Like the First Time, man. Oh, that was my song for a long time. And I don't care where I saw Foreigner at, man, when they broke out with, I have waited a lifetime. Man, and I, you know, back in them days, we had our own air guitars, so we would be like, what the... Man, and I looked around that Coliseum, I didn't see one black person at that concert. 
I remember thinking, man, I am bad. <laughs> Woo! And from that point on, I became a, a legend in my own mind. And I hung out with these five girls, five white girls. And, man, they could do whatever they wanted to do, man. I remember I was at my friend Rebecca's house. We were down in the basement, and Rebecca's mother called a family meeting. I'd never heard of it. Never heard of a family meeting. But her mother called downstairs. She went, Rebecca? <laughs> That's my white woman voice. Rebecca? <laughs> Your father and I have been communicating. And Rebecca, Rebecca, we understand that there's been alcohol consumption. And what your father and I have talked about, Rebecca, is that we'd like for you kids to drink at home if you're going to drink. I said, what your mother just say? <laughs> she said, yeah, she wants us to drink at home. Man, I thought that was the closest family I ever met in my life, man. <laughs> oh, I couldn't believe it. And I hung out with these girls, man, and, and we, just, we just hung out and we did all kinds of stuff. But my friend Rebecca came over to my house one day. And she had a, a brown bag with two bottles in it. Pulled them out. It was Boone's Farm Apple Wine. Okay. You know what? I talk at my church on a regular basis, right? When I tell them that I drank Boone's Farm, they don't have that kind of reaction. <laughs> but at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, when I mention Boone's Farm, everybody's like, hey, ha-ha, <laughs> we know that one. Yeah, I drank that and was sleep on the sidewalk. So Rebecca gave me that bottle. She told me that her uh, brother had schooled her in the art of chugging and uh, that we needed to turn these bottles up and we needed to drink as long and as hard as we could. And, and I turned my bottle up and she turned hers up. And I can tell you without a shadow of doubt that what happened to Rebecca was totally different than what happened to me. Man, this feeling rose it was, at, let me take my shoes off. I'm, I'm really short. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and I drank that wine and, and it started at the bottom of my feet, man, and it was rising slowly. It was rising slowly. I don't know about you, but the way that I felt when I drank that wine, man, I have based relationships on the way to, if you can make me feel like this, we good to go. We good to go. We married for life. If you can do for me, what that wine did for me, we good to go. So I, Rebecca, she just did what she did. Me, it took on a whole new world and meaning for me. Man, my hair changed colors. <laughs> Freckles just flew off my face one at a time. And man, I was the happiest girl alive. And I'm going to tell you something about this alcohol. When I drank that night, I knew without a shadow of a doubt that I was going to drink every opportunity I got. Nothing else mattered. Like it talks about in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, alcohol became my master. From that day forward, I set out and I drank and I did it every opportunity I got. And I hung out with these girls. And you know, it's a couple little drugs in my store. You know what I mean? Don't trip out and be talking to me after the meeting and stuff. <laughs> you know, really. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I feel like I'm a member in good standing. But they asked me to talk, so if you got a problem, talk to Dan. <laughs> so I did a couple little hallucinogens, you know. Well, I know y'all don't know nothing about that uh, since all y'all just drank alcohol. But for this alcoholic, I did a couple little hallucinogens, and they got me a you know, a mental health diagnosis and, uh, you know, smoked a little pot, you know, but it didn't have me do nothing but, you know, eat stuff out of people's freezer that had been there for about 10 years, <laughs> you know, and my answer to everything was wow, you know what I mean? They say, Angie, somebody just threw a lit match in your hair, I would go, wow. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, there's some reasons why I'm qualifying myself for Alcoholics Anonymous. So I, uh, you know, did it, but I have to tell you this, you know, I did a little hit of acid one night, you know, and, you know, my friend Rebecca was with me and all my little friends and I was driving and, and they said, here, Angie, they gave me two and told me to take one, but you know how many I took and, and, uh, you know, all of a sudden it hit me and, you know, it was, you know, strawberry mescaline. Now I know that y'all don't know anything about that here in Akron, uh, you know. 
in Chicago and all that good stuff. But in Cincinnati, they gave it to me. And man, let me tell you something. I started driving down Kemper Road in Cincinnati and things start to get colorful. The car seemed as if it was just floating right along. The birds was flying low and waving. You see? <laughs> flying low. And they decided that they wanted something to eat. So uh, they said, hey, Ange, why don't you go to McDonald's? We want to get a sandwich. I said, no problem. So I, you know, floated on into McDonald's with the flowers all around it and everything. And, and I get to this little yellow box and, uh, you know, somebody in there talking about what you want, you know. <laughs> kept on asking me over and over again, you know, getting ready to ruin my buzz. See what I'm saying? What you want? See, and this is what, see, this is when it went from a good one to a bad one. So he's steady yelling at me. What you want? What do you, what do you want? What do you want? Welcome, welcome. What do you want? I said, uh, nobody. What do you want? And so I began going off on him in the little box and everything. And, and I'm not a good fighter, but I figured he was only this big so I could whoop him. And... <laughs> And, 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 you know, I, that I went around, you know, as they do through the little drive through and then I got to the last window, and the car wouldn't move, and they called the police, and, and uh, you know, rightfully so, so here come the police looking all funny, you know what I mean? And, uh, and he started talking to me like this, ma'am, 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 ma'am. What, 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 what is the, 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 the problem, ma'am? And I said, you know what, officer? You may as well just go ahead and put the handcuffs on me, cuz. <laughs> and that was my first experience with the judicial system. And I'm going to tell you something. My parents, they called my parents from jail, and they said, yes, we have your daughter Angela down here. And uh, my mother said, well, make sure she stays warm and hung up. <laughs> Some people had enabling parents. I didn't have enabling parents. My mother told me, you know what? You want to live that kind of life? That's fine. We got other kids to raise. And I'm going to tell you something. I began to hang out. And I began to do the stuff. And I had this thing. You know, I'm drinking on a regular basis. I'm drinking stuff that just didn't make any sense to me. You know what I mean? But I just, I drank and I drank. I met, if you're an artist like I am, you kind of wait for the day when somebody discovers you. And uh, my dad had got me a job at a recording studio and... Uh, I was in the bathroom and I hit my best Whitney Houston note. And uh, and all of a sudden I step out the bathroom and it's a tall brother standing there. He said, uh, excuse me, was that you singing? I said, yes, sir. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was. And he said, I can make you famous. I said, for real? He said, yeah, I can make you famous. All you got to do is come to Las Vegas with me. What? No problem. Somebody need to tell him we're in a meeting. So, so look. So uh, he tells me, so I go home and I call a family meeting, right? Because I'm getting ready to go make my first Grammy in Las Vegas, Nevada. So I call, go home and I call it. I said, we need to have a family meeting. My mother said, what the? So everybody comes upstairs. You know, my father comes over and I said, look, I'll be back for you. As soon as I get my first Grammy, and my father always kept things real simple, he would just say things like, something is wrong with you. <laughs> he kept things real simple. But I had my mother telling me, Angie, don't go. And my little sister saying, Angie, don't go. But I had to go, see, because he told me those three are the easier, softer way. And I need to tell you that I went out to, um, to Las Vegas, Nevada. I was a young girl singing in casinos, making a lot of money, and having the time of my life having the time of my life. But I don't know about you. I'm drinking in Las Vegas. Alcohol is flowing freely, and I'm drinking, and now what's happening is I'm starting to not remember things. I don't know that it happens to you. But to me, I didn't even know that was called a blackout until I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. I thought that if you didn't remember what you did last night, you had a good time. I really, truly believe that. But, you know, I started waking up next to people. Uh, <laughs> both of us waking up, looking at each other, going, dang, you know what I mean? 
and he got one tooth and it's gold. <laughs> See, there's some reasons why I continue through this recovery process, because that's the kind of stuff that happens to me when I drink. So I'm out here with this gentleman. He's got his own affliction. And uh, I began to do what he was doing, and I'm drinking at the same time, and I'm starting to get blacklisted in Las Vegas. I can't get a job because, see, I didn't hear until I got to Alcoholics Anonymous that the first drink was the problem. I never heard that. You know what people told me? People said, Angie, just stop it too. Don't drink five. Drink beer. Drink light beer. You know what I mean? That's what I heard. I didn't hear until I got to AA that the first drink was the problem. So here I am, this gentleman, we, we go, we spiraling down. By this time, we living in a little seedy hotel. I ain't got nothing, y'all. Nothing. And he, we got a, a wrecked up car. And he's doing his thing and I'm doing mine. And he comes and he picks me up. And he said he wanted me to drive him to the store. And when I drove him to the store, he went in and he shot and killed the owner and he robbed the place. Now, I don't know about you. But some people can say they know what's going to happen when they drink. For this alcoholic, I think I know what's going to happen. But I really don't. Because you couldn't have told me when I took that drink of alcohol at the age of 13 with my friend Rebecca that I would be on trial for complicity and murder some years later. So I'm sitting here in Las Vegas in this courthouse listening to these people tell me what kind of person I was. And one of the reasons why I share that with you is because for a long time it kept me sick. See, I thought that if I told you that story about me, you wouldn't want to be my friend. You wouldn't be, you didn't want to be my, you wouldn't want to be in my life. And I remember my sponsor told me, she said, from the podium, I want you to start telling them people the truth because you might help somebody that's got a secret that's killing them. And if you're new in the room, get yourself a sponsor. And start working these steps so that you can free yourself. Because I need to tell you, I spent many years of my life in prison. But ain't nothing nothing worse than being locked up in the bondage of self, man. That's the worst, man. That's the worst. And so, we go to trial. This gentleman is still in prison as we speak. And here I am. At Founders Day. But I'm going to tell you something. I got a floater out of the state of Nevada. And that's a letter that you get from the governor. And when I read it, I'm just going to tell you what it said to me. It said, as long as you black, don't you come back to Nevada. (laughs) Now, there was more words than that. But that's what it said to me. I don't even watch stuff on TV about Las Vegas. That's how scared I am. So I come back to Cincinnati with all the resolve, all the resolve in the world. That's it, no more. I'm coming back to Cincinnati. I'm going to get a job and I'm going to do the right thing. And I meant that from the bottom of my heart. Not even knowing that I had alcoholism and left to my own devices, there was no way that I could stop. No way that I could stop, because I'm going to tell you something. If you're new in the room, I'm going to tell you something. Every time I said I wasn't going to do it no more, I meant it from the bottom of my heart. But I had no idea that I had alcoholism, and it dictates and manages my life. It dictates and manages my life. And I'm going to tell you something. I had no idea. So I come back to Cincinnati. A long time ago in Cincinnati, you could get on the Sunday bus. It was called Sunday Sunday Pass Ride. And you would get on the Metro bus ride all over the city. Boy, me and my brother and sister did that one day, and we got to downtown Cincinnati to the corner of Liberty and Vine. And boy, I looked over there. It was a little restaurant over there. Pimps, Cadillacs and Lincolns, prostitutes. And I remember my little sister said, boy, you could pay me to go over there. And my brother was like, shoo, me neither. And I remember thinking, I'm going over there tomorrow. So I started taking the number 20 bus, riding it all the way downtown, hanging downtown to Liberty and Vine with the gangsters. With the gangsters. Drinking and sitting in bars like, like Sealy was in the juke joint on the color purple. You see, grinning widely and drinking wine. That's what I was doing. And man, people were coming in there and they were shooting each other. Man, it didn't get no more exciting than that. If they wasn't shooting me, I was good. 
But as long as they were shooting each other, no problem. And I started hanging out downtown Cincinnati. I hung out with these three guys, no neck, greasy feet, and tight eye. And I'm going to tell you something, I thought these guys was geniuses. They took me one day when I was under the influence and told me to put this girdle on and go in this department store and roll up clothes and stick them around the girdle, close my coat, and walk out of the store. I thought they were brilliant. Brilliant until I went to jail. And they informed me that that was stealing. And so I'm hanging out with these guys. I'm going to the store stealing. I'm drunk. And ain't nothing worse in the world than to be a drunk thief. Because you get caught. I remember when I first got sober. I was over at my father's house and I was on the phone talking. You know how we do when we're new, talking. I was like, yeah, you know, when I was out there, I was a little hustler and everything. You know, made a little money, did what I had to do, make it do what it do. And uh, I got off the phone and my father said, look here, baby, let me tell you something. You were not a hustler. A hustler don't go to jail every time he commits a crime. He said, you know who, you know who goes to jail every time they commit a crime, Angie? I said, what, Daddy? He said, a fool goes to, that's what you need to start telling people. Hello, I'm a fool. <laughs> My parents didn't enable me in any kind of way. And, uh, and so I started hanging out. Now I'm going, to, I'm going to jail. And I'm coming out of jail long enough to stay on the streets to drink a little while. And then I go back to jail. And one day I go to jail. They give me a physical and I find out I'm pregnant. And I'm headed to the Ohio Reformatory for Women with a 7 to 25 with a child growing on the inside. And I'm going to tell you something. The only thing that kept me from losing my mind was the fact that I would rub my stomach and I would tell my baby, this is it. I'm not going to do this no more. This is it. And I meant that from the bottom of my heart. I had to call my mother because the warden came to me and he said, you need to find some place for this baby to go because of the amount of time that you're doing. It'll become a ward of the state. And by this time, my parents had kicked me to the curb. They didn't want nothing to do with me. And I had to call my mother and I said, Mama, I need y'all to come to the penitentiary and get my son. My mother said, Angie, you got a baby. I said, yes, ma'am. And I need you to come and get it. And they did just that. They didn't stop to see me. They had nothing to say to me. But they said that that child did not deserve. We'll take it. And they came and they got that baby and I watched them through a slit like this. Come and get my child. And I remember y'all from the bottom of my heart, man, saying, I'm going to get my act together. And I meant that from the bottom of my heart. I meant it. When I got my freedom, my son was four years old. All the way down 71 South. That's all I could think about was my son. All I could think about. I can't wait to see my child. I can't wait to see my child. I get to the Greyhound bus station and suddenly the thought crossed my mind. If you're new in the room, it's in more about alcoholism. Suddenly the thought crossed my mind that surely one drink ain't going to hurt me. As much as I love and wanted to see my child, surely one drink ain't going to hurt me. And the next time I saw my son, he was 10 years old. See, I don't know if you know about the powerfulness of disease of alcoholism, but I know that when I put alcohol in my system, what happens to me? I got plenty of plans. I meant to go see my child, but what do I say to my family? What do I say to the people that's got my child? I was drinking. That wouldn't fly. So you know what I did? I did what any good alcoholic would do. I act like it didn't exist. And I kept up drinking. And I'm going back and forth to the penitentiary. I need to tell you that by the time I got done with my last penitentiary bit, they sat me at the parole board and they told me that I was institutionalized. They said, you will die in an institution, Angie. But thank you for Alcoholics Anonymous. Because you guys told me differently. You said if you do what we do, you can get what we got. You didn't care whether I had been in the penitentiary. You stuck with that tradition that said the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. And if you got the old transcript, it says an honest desire to stop drinking. And that's what I had. So I get out of jail. They let me out one time. And I get pregnant again. And I need to tell you that I drank. 
alcohol through my whole entire pregnancy. I didn't have one day of prenatal care with my daughter. And I'm not proud of that, but that's what alcoholism did to me. I drank through my whole pregnancy. But I knew I was going to give her up for adoption because I couldn't take care of her. And when I got sober, the biggest lie I told my sponsor was that I gave my daughter up so that she could have a better life. That is not true. I gave my daughter up because I knew that I could not continue to live the lifestyle I was living if she was with me. Alcohol had became my master, and that's all that mattered. So I meet this couple. See, I'm a believer in angels. So I meet this couple who say they open up a restaurant. They're opening up a restaurant in Bloomington, Indiana, and asked me if I wanted to go. I said, I'm giving my baby up for adoption. And they said, you can work at our restaurant. And my daughter was born. The family was picked. And I went into labor, and this couple went into the labor and delivery room. They were there with me. And they held my hand as I gave birth to my daughter. And when you give a child up for adoption, they come and they throw this black tarp over you when the baby's about to come. And they come and they take my baby. And they take her to the nursery and they take me to medical. And I'm laying there and the phone rings. And it's my parents. They said, don't you get that baby up. We'll take her. You just bring her home. So I got on the Greyhound bus with my daughter, and I said, God, please, just don't let her cry, because I didn't know nothing about babies, y'all. I said, God, just don't let her cry. And I held that baby on the Greyhound bus, and she didn't make one sound. We got to the Greyhound bus station, and my parents were there. And my father got out of that pickup truck, and he came over, and he took my little girl out of my arms, and he said, Angie, we got it from here. And I said, what am I supposed to do? And they said, we don't know what you're supposed to do, baby. But she didn't ask for this. And they took my daughter and they drove off. And from that, that point on, I drank like there was no tomorrow. I drank. And you know what? I couldn't, I couldn't get any sobriety. I just couldn't get sober because it was just too much to bear. I don't know if you understand that, but it was just too much to bear to be sober. I can't think. I don't want to feel. I don't want to do anything. And that's what I did. I didn't want to feel. I'm drink. I'm living at this house, <laughs> this boarding house in Cincinnati on the banks of the Ohio River. So I've been reduced to all of this. I done had it all, y'all, and I ain't had nothing. So I'm up at this bar on Vine Street. Somebody asked me to go get high. I go with them. We drink it. They pull out some dope to shoot it into my arms, and it was ice water. And they shot ice water into my veins. I left that place, and I walked 17 blocks down to this place. Saying to God, I don't want to die like this. And I felt like I was going to die. And I said, God, I don't want to die like this. I don't want my family to find me like this. I'm a believer in angels. Because I got to that place and it was a little blonde woman standing there. And she said to me, you don't have to keep living like that. And I said, I'm sick and I need some help. And she said, she went up to my room with me and she put a rag on my head and she began to tell me her story. She didn't talk about how much she drank. But she talked about how she felt as a result of her drinking. And I'll tell you what, she asked me to go someplace with her. And if you would have told me it would have made me feel better, I would have went with anybody. And she took me to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. She took me to my first meeting. And I must tell you that I have not seen that woman since that meeting. Never saw her again. But she took me to my first meeting. So we pull up in, in front of this clubhouse. It's about 200 Harleys parked out front. All these white people with white cups. And I was like, well, it looked like it's going to be a, a pretty nice party, I guess. And I start walking up this walk. And people started reaching out their hands. They said, welcome. Welcome. My name is so-and-so. Welcome. My name is so-and-so. I said, well, good. At least they friendly. And I get to the top of the step and this big biker dude grabs me and he goes, Welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. My name is Squirrel. <laughs> and I was like, Squirrel, man, you might have to put me down, bruh. <laughs> and why they name your big butt Squirrel? And then the thought came to me, Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, Oh, sister, you have hit an all-time low. 
You are in Alcoholics Anonymous. So we go into this big room and she said, some guy's getting ready to tell his story. So I sat way over to the, to the right by the window in case I needed to jump. And, uh, and all of a sudden this white guy gets up and he starts, yep, slept under a bridge. Then the whole room would go, ah, <laughs> this newcomer mentality. I said, well, these white people are crazy up in here. He said, I slept on the bridge. I used to beat my wife every day. And I was like, this is, I'm appalled. I'm appalled at this. Then she said, then, after he got finished, everybody rose up. And they start praying. And I kept one eye open because I wasn't sure what was going on. And all together, they just started, keep coming back, get something, keep coming back it irks if it work it keep no that ain't what I thought they said <laughs> it keep coming back I'm going to tell you what I thought they said because, and I know I'm going to hear some stuff about this but I thought they said keep coming back it squirts if you jerk it that's what I thought they said <laughs> And I said, well, okay, I guess I'll stay. (laughs) And I started coming to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm going to tell you something. I came to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous never really thinking that I was quite like y'all. Now, I knew I had some issues, but the big A word, I wasn't sure about the alcohol. So I'm sitting in meetings and and militant, and, you know, everything's because I'm black. And I'm at the coffee bar one day, and they wouldn't give me my coffee in time. And I just stood at the coffee bar. I said, it's because I'm black, ain't it? That's why I can't get my black coffee. Why I got to drink my black coffee out of a white cup? Why I can't drink it out of a black cup? And my sponsor was with me, right? She's a white woman from England. She goes, would you sit down? I said, no, I just got to let them know we ain't going nowhere. We in here for the long haul. So all of a sudden, here come this little white girl. Up at the podium. Before I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, (laughs) I really didn't like black people. (laughs) But now, thanks to God and the steps and relentless sponsorship, I do. So I stood up and I was like, well, we ain't going nowhere, baby. Power to the people. Freedom. Freedom. (laughs) My sponsor said, would you sit down? I said, well, you know why me and you talking about it? Actually, I might need to tell you a little something that you're going to have to be a little special with me, you know, with civil rights and all, and my ancestors picking cotton. She goes, oh, really? Who do you know that picked cotton? I said, well, I don't know nobody personally. (laughs) She said, until you do... I don't want to hear that from you. I said, well, all right. And let me tell you about that sponsorship thing. See, my sponsor, y'all told me to get somebody I wanted what they had, right? She pulled up to the clubhouse in a candy apple red sports car. Listen, with a little Mr. T starter set on. Rings on every finger. I said, well, that goes my sponsor right there. So she was walking up the walk, you know, all happy. You know how happy, happy alcoholics walk, the odio, odio. You know what I mean? And she, <laughs> grateful, grateful, grateful. And so she, <laughs> so she comes up the steps, right? She coming up the walk. I jump in front of her. I say, hey, white lady, would you be my sponsor? She says, I'd love to be your sponsor. I said, can I drive your car? She said, she goes, oh my goodness, keep coming back. And <laughs> coming back. And, and like I said, I stayed, I stayed around AA for a little while and, you know, then they start coming in AA with this little, you know, crack problem and, you know, then I got all, you know, bothered and stuff. And, and uh, I was sitting uh, at Oak Street and and the, suddenly the thought crossed my mind that I had been in AA long enough and, you know, somebody really needed this seat. So y'all were talking about God using you as an instrument. I said, you know what? 
I bet you God using me as an instrument too. He want me to go find some black people and bring them into AA. So I go to the Wednesday night 830 meeting because I said since I was coming that surely you would want to know if I was leaving. So they asked if it was any AA announcements. And the old timer goes, yes, Angie. I said, I'm going to roll on up out of here. Thank you for the real thick book and everything and keep coming back and live and let live. But uh, I'm going to roll on out of here. And guess what this old timer said? You know how sensitive they are, right? He goes, well, get out of here then. <laughs> There's people trying to stay sober. We'll see you if you make it back. I was like, oh, dag, Mr. Old Timer. Okay, bye. And um, I took my big book and, uh, and, and, and I went outside and I went down to the number 43 bus. And I said, the first black person I see that looked like they drunk, I'm going to carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. So I get on that bus and boom, here come a brother. Drunk as he want to be. I slid over next door. I said, look here, brother. You been drinking? He said, yeah, I had a little something, something. I said, oh, look here, brother, you might be an alcoholic. So he started cussing me out and stuff. And I told him, I said, you know, the people at the double-A club told me that you would probably react like this to my information. So what I'm going to have to do to you, brother, is give it the way only you could receive it and the only way that I know how. And I told you I'm from a family of Baptist ministers. So I stood up, turned the book to chapter 5, held it up, and I said, Really? Did you hear what I said? I said, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. <laughs> but I said, those who do not recover are those who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. Wait a minute. So the bus driver said, oh, hell no, baby. You got to get... He said, oh, no, baby, you got to get off this bus right now. I told him he was an alcoholic, too, right? So I go down to the bar where I know it's some black alcoholics, right? So I walk on in the bar, and they dance and trying to act like they had a good time. But I knew they was in pain because I had been in AA. And uh, so I go back to the jukebox, and I snatch it out of there. I said, look here, black alcoholics. They got a place for you. It's called the Double A Club, and you, too, never have to drink again. And they was like, well, what you doing down here? I said, oh, I graduated. <laughs> I said, and step, step 18 said, I'm supposed to come down here and help y'all. <laughs> so, you know, they was like, girl, if you don't plug that jukebox in, we'll shoot you. I was like, y'all tripping. So I climbed up on the bar, and I opened up that book, the chapter 5. And I stood up on that bar, and I said, Rally! Did you hear what I said? I said, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. I said, those who do not recover are those who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. And the bar owner went, oh, hell no, baby, you got to. He said, I'm trying to make some money up in here, sister. You got to go. So I stood outside the bar. They locked the door. And I stood outside the bar reading a big book to the passerbys. And suddenly the thought crossed my mind that surely one drink ain't going to hurt. And I went in there, y'all, and everything that y'all told me was going to happen, happened. It got worse. Man, I did things on the street, y'all, under the influence of alcohol that I didn't ever think I would do ever think I would do. And I came back to Alcoholics Anonymous, y'all, June the 20th, 1991. I weighed 85 pounds. I hadn't had a bath in weeks. I had the same clothes that I had on. I was living outside. I had been reduced to animal level. And I'm getting food however I can. But I'm going to tell you something. I went to that clubhouse and I walked back to that coffee bar and that old timer was in there. That was at the Wednesday night meeting and he looked at me and he said, Angie, you're going to die. And I said, I know and I need you to help me. And he went on the shelf and he pulled the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous out and he said, you go stand at that door and you shake hands. And I said, look at me. I said, I ain't had no bath. He said, you go to that door and you reach your hand out. And for the members of Alcoholics Anonymous that shook my hand, I'll be forever grateful. Forever grateful. See, 
we got to be real careful. We got to be real careful that them people that come into these clubhouses and come into meetings that may be dirty and stinking and talking to themselves, we got to be real careful because they could be your next Founder Day speaker. And I came back on in to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I started doing the stuff that my sponsor told me to do. Because you know what? I was finally properly horrified and thoroughly convinced that I can't drink alcohol. And I began to do what my sponsor told me to do. And she started working the steps with me. And I started to get some freedom, y'all. From the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and the, tw- and the 12 traditions. And the book. I started to get some freedom, man. And people started to remember my name in AA. People started saying, how you doing, Angie? And if you knew in the room, I know how you feel when somebody comes up to you. You ain't been in the AA long, and then they say, how you doing, Angie? You don't know what that does to new people. Because I'm going to tell you something, I love new people. They the next generation of this thing. I want this thing to be here for my son. You see what I'm saying? And it says that love and tolerance is our code. And I stood at that door, y'all, and just as many people that shook my hand, just as many walked past and looked at me like I had no right to be here because of the way that I looked. And I'm going to tell you something. It's a miracle, y'all, that I'm here. But I'm going to tell you something. I love Alcoholics Anonymous, man. I ain't got nowhere else to go. This is it for me. This is it for me. And I'm glad for those trusted servants that when I'm sitting in a meeting and people introducing themselves as chemically challenged and dippy doodle lighters, I'm grateful for those members of Alcoholics Anonymous that keep it to the singleness of purpose. The singleness of purpose. I love AA, y'all. I want it to be here for forever. Let me tell you about my daughter. My daughter is 21 and she attends Grambling State University in Louisiana. I ain't did nothing. I ain't did nothing. At three years sober, my family asked me to stay out of my kids' life and let them have the same kind of life that I had. And for the first time in my life, I made a decision that was selfless. I said, okay, I won't come around. But if you got kids and you love them like I did, I had to see my kids. And I would drive to that soccer field and I would have a baseball hat on and sunglasses and I'd be sitting way in the corner. But I'd watch it. And I'd be at my son's basketball games, way up in the bleachers with a baseball hat and sunglasses on, but I had to see them. I watched my daughter go to prom from up the street, sit looking out of a car. I watched her go to prom and she came out of there and she got in that limo and I thought to myself, she is beautiful, man. Man, she look like me, man. She, she's fine. And on my daughter's 18th birthday, man, she called me. And she said, I want to see you. And I went and I picked her up. And we went to the mall. And she spent all my money. every dime I had. And then I realized after I talked to my sponsor that I should be a little more specific in my prayers. Say that I want to see my kids and I'd like to have a little change in my pocket afterwards. (laughs) And I'm going to tell you something. This is the amazing things about kids, man. Because I went and picked her up. We went to the mall and on the way home, man, she had her head on my shoulder. And she said, Angie, you don't drink no more. I said, no, baby. I don't drink no more. And she said, you doing all right? And I said, I'm doing good. I said, I'm an Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm just working on staying sober one day at a time. And she said, well, I don't want to create no problems between you and the family. But I wanted to see you, and I was able to make amends to my daughter and tell her every single day that I thought about her. And that I got this thing called alcoholism, that as much as I love her, it won't let me get to her. As much as I love her. Oh, yeah. And she's dating a white guy. (laughs) I don't care who you are. You hear that news. You got something to say about it. 
But he's a good guy. He's a good guy. He's a good guy. And I got a son who's in prison, who's in jail as we speak. And I thank God for the program of al Because every day I want to go get my baby out of jail. But my sponsor said, you can't go get him, Angie. You know why? Because you'd be going to get him to make yourself feel better. And that's what, that ain't what this is about. And so you know what? Thank God for the people with Alcoholics Anonymous that take AA to jail. Because my son wrote me and he going to meetings, man. You know? He doing his thing. You know what I'm saying? I'm just grateful to be sober, y'all. I'm grateful that the committee would ask me to come here and do something like this. I couldn't even read when I got to AA, y'all. Thank God for the 530 Big Book meeting. Thank God for the members of Alcoholics Anonymous that when I sat in meetings and everybody else was getting irritated because I couldn't say words right, thank God for the trusted servants who told me what the word meant and spelled it for me. And I got my GED in sobriety. And then I got, let me tell you something, I got my GED December 7, 1999. And when that thing came in the mail, man, I grabbed it and I just fell back on the bed and I said, I'm going to college. I'm going to college, man. I remember I took that thing and I ran up to the University of Cincinnati and I was like, I want to go, I want to go to college. (laughs) And they said, what do you want to do? I said, I don't know. And about this time, they uh, had incorporated the School of Addiction Studies into the University of Cincinnati, and I'm now certified with liberal arts and social sciences in addiction studies. Man, God has been so good to me, y'all. God has been so good to me. And I just have to say, man, if you're new in the room, man, stay here. In spite of what your mind tells you, stay here. Hook up with some people who can keep you accountable. Thank God for my friends in AA, man. Thank God, thank God for the friends that I met all across the country. After I spoke at the International Convention AA, my whole life changed, y'all. And I got to go places and I still get to go places that I only saw in magazines. Carrying the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. But I'm going to share this with you and then I'm going to shut up. Back home, my grandmother, she used to rock in her rocking chair, right? And she would always hum this song and I never ever knew what the meaning of it was. And if you don't mind, I'm going to close with this song. Amazing grace, how sweet the the sound, and that same. Oh, a wretch like me. See, I was was lost, but now I'm I'm found. I was blind. But now I I see. God bless you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.